Ray Tinkin, my friend for over 60 years, is my guest today. He is a very successful businessman with an eighth grade education. If he wants it, he can pretty much write a check for it. He's a self-made man, but one who quickly gives credit to those who helped him along the way. About two and a half years ago, I was in the audience of the funeral service for Ray's mama, Mary Weldon. I have obviously been to many funeral services, but never had I been moved more than I was at that service that day. Ray said a few words that day about his mama and his life. Although I knew the story, I had never heard Ray tell it. You will learn in this podcast that Ray grew up very hard. You will hear about that, and he will tell you he was angry with the world. He fought his way through life. Growing up, we all knew him as someone you certainly did not want to get in a fight with. He was tough. He was relentless. He would hurt you. But he was also determined to make something of himself. Maybe one of the reasons I was so moved at that funeral that day was because he was just the opposite of the person most of us knew as kids growing up. He was humble, meek, introspective, and thoughtful. He was a man who was deeply grieving, but a man who was at peace with the world. I thought he was strong before, but that day he was stronger than I had ever seen him. It was remarkable. I understand people handle adversity and hardship in different ways. Some are broken by it and buckle under the stress and never get over it. Others learn from it and become determined to overcome and be better for it. The people in their lives are greatly impacted no matter which path they choose. The wide path that most choose makes things worse and the suffering gets greater. For those who choose the narrow path, it is much more difficult, but it ultimately makes things better. Ray Tinkin chose the narrow and more difficult path. His story will get your attention. If you're in a very difficult place and wonder if you'll ever get out of it, you will be inspired. As a child, Ray lied in his bed many nights crying and asking God, Will my life always be like this? Now his prayer has changed. You're about to meet my friend Ray Tinker. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker. This is Bruce Goddard, and you're listening to the View from a Hearse podcast. I've got a special guest with me today. We've been friends for, gosh, over 60 years. His name is Ray Tinkin. He's got a story that will shake you in your boots. I don't know how long it's been, Ray. A couple of years ago, your mother died, and Ray spoke at his mother's funeral. And one of the things he said that I'll never forget, he said that as a kid, I would cry myself to sleep at night and asking God, will life always be like this? He started with really almost nothing, and he's made a heck of a life. He's one of the most successful businessmen in our county. He can write a check for anything he wants to buy, and he's a heck of a good guy. So thank you, Ray, for doing this. I appreciate it, man, you honoring me by getting on here and talking about this. Some of this stuff is probably not easy to talk about, but I think it's a story that, that needs to be told. So talk about what was going on when you were a young kid growing up. Uh, I know right where you grew up, out close to what we call Possum Trot out in that area, but, but just talk about that. I grew up in Reynolds. I remember starting a school in 1959. We lived in an old house out in the country, and Daddy worked for Swearington Chevrolet at the time. The old house we lived in, you could see the chickens under the house. The bathroom was out there by the cedar tree. We finally got water and a bathroom when I was 13. 
And my daddy was an alcoholic. Daddy drank every day of his life. And Mom and I, as it's been a lot of times, Mom and I, we didn't have anything to eat. I've been to bed cold. I've been to bed hungry. And and I lay in the bed at night, and I pray to God every night. But the thing about it, I asked God one time, is God is going to always be like this? And I just knew then that I didn't want to be like my daddy. And I wanted things. I remember many a time Mom and I would have to walk to Watley's Pond to get water because our well froze up and we didn't have water. And back then it was old tin buckets. They didn't have five-gallon buckets. You were only only son, right? <laughs> only only son, child. Only child. And But the only thing I can say my daddy did give me, <clears throat> he gave me a skill to do body work. I was painting cars when I was 12. You were driving when you were 13. I remember you drive to elementary school. I, I drive to school. My, I drive my grandpa's old truck. And I stayed with my grand, grandma and grandpa uh, a lot. But one day, I decided I got enough. I'll never forget, I was 16 years old, and I was helping my daddy out at the house. And daddy was drinking that day. He done got pretty well polluted. And... It was freezing, and icicles was hanging at the end of my blue jeans. And I uh, told Daddy, I said, Daddy, it's too cold to water sand this car. He said, you going to sand that car. So the next thing I know, Daddy slapped me upside the head because I told him I wasn't going to. And y'all got to think about it being 30 degrees, what your ears felt like when somebody slapped you. When he did, I just lost it right then. I knocked my daddy completely out on the ground and that's the first time I'd ever hit him but I figured that was the day when I need to leave so you to back up a little bit what your dad and, and it, you know of course I grew up here in the same town so everybody mm -hmm. knew that your daddy was an alcoholic right. but he was also the best body man he was the best you, body you would man. never you would when you talked about Bill Tinkin you would say he's always drunk but he's the best body man you'll ever find anywhere. You learned, even though, like all of us, he had his faults, but he taught you what you're doing now. Exactly. <laughs> so I know exactly you're forever right. grateful for that. So right? I, I got that from him. Yeah. And uh, at the time, my mama said she had enough, so mama left too. My mama had moved in with me and my grandmother in Reynolds, and she had met this James Weldon was a good man. He was he would be called my children's grandpa, right? Because he loved them. No question about and it. He took care of them, but Mama's always been by my side, and that's the reason I say I miss my Mama still today. But if it wasn't for my Mama, I wouldn't be where I'm at. You also, if, if I remember right, you quit school in the eighth grade, right? I got a whole eighth grade education. That's all I got. Isn't that amazing? I went to Butler for about a month. And I decided that uh, I need to go to work because I made more money than a lot of teachers made when they was teaching school and painting cars and fixing cars on the side. And I knew where it was at. Right. So I just kept doing what I know how to do. I went to work for Huckabee Cadillac. And then I worked for Barney A. Smith. So you were like 15 to 16 years old then or whatever? No. 16? Uh, when I was 15, 16 years old, I went. 17 years old, I got a job at Bluebird and lied about my age. <laughs> and they gave me a job. They kept asking for my birth certificate, and they kept asking me for my driving license. I told them I didn't have any driving license. And finally, when I did get my driving license, I mean, my finally when I did turn 18, I kept my birth certificate. <laughs> and it was about two months shy. I'd have been working for two months. <laughs> so what did they do? They just kept letting me keep working. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't remember you working at Bluebird. So you, you also tell the story in there that you would walk at night oh, yeah. to, to the pond to get water, yeah. and you'd go to bed hungry. I'd go to bed hungry. And, and you'd many nights cry yourself sleep That's and right. thinking, what in the heck? And, we, and didn't, that, we didn't even have a car back then. Yeah, and, and you were going to school with you know people that became your lifelong friends. That's right. But you could see the difference. You made the comment that your mother made your shirts. That's right. And and you saw other people that were had had store bought shirts and yeah. all that. Talk about that a little bit. And well, I I remember uh, Miss Cat Brady. 
uh, sometime mama would get enough money to go up and buy me a new shirt because I wanted new shirts like everybody else. They had the black and white checkered shirts, and my, mine looked like camouflage by the time mama got through with them, but they still look good, and mama used to get the pattern from Cat Brady. I remember getting the new shirts. I think I had three or four, one, maybe three or four pair of blue jeans. And at one time, Mama bought me a pair of corduroy breeches. And she said, don't wear those breeches. You have to wear them on a uh, weekend. But I wanted to wear them. And I went and climbed the fence and tore them, fence, tore them corduroy breeches. I didn't even go home that day. But uh, well, I left when I did go home, Mama said, I told you not to wear them breeches. <laughs> and you can't patch corduroy. <laughs> so you remember the time, you just reminded me, talking about school, uh, when uh, our friend Wimley Hartley, Mud Duck, Mud Duck, got in a fight with Mr. Hogan down at the elementary school. You remember yeah, that story? Yeah. And uh, matter of fact, me and Mr. Hogan went around one time. <laughs> Mr. Hogan used to push everybody out at the ball field. And he pushed me one day, and I said, look, that's enough pushing now. He said, well, you want to put them boxing gloves on? I said, yes, sir, I sure do. <laughs> I bet you did. And we went back, and I told Mr. Hogan up, and he ain't never messed with me no more. But the thing about it, Mr. Hogan, Mr. Hogan was a great, great teacher. We really loved him. We was kind of like the welcome back Carter class. Wimley and Audrey Wyndham and Brenda Children and Junior Sudaf, and, and they kept all of us in one little room. <laughs> But uh, I had a good school, you know. I ran into James Wyndham. I, I said Wimberly Hartley. I'm sorry. Well, James Wyndham. It was James Wyndham that got that was beating up Mr. Hogan. So we yeah. were in PE class, and they everybody came running in and said, Mr. Helms, come out here. James Wyndham was beating up Mr. Hogan. And James had him behind his back, and he was kneeing him in the butt and just knocking him up in the air. And he was just – Mr. Hogan didn't have a chance with James Wyndham. I'm sorry I – had the name wrong a while ago, but it was James Wyndham. So that was always funny to me. And then I ran into James up here at Fort Wayne one day, not, you know, four or five years ago, maybe been six years ago. And I, I saw him and I started talking to him. I said, James, I'll never forget that as long as and I was laughing because I thought it's funny. And all of a sudden his laughter, he stopped the laughter. He said, let me tell you something. I had had pneumonia. I'd been out of school for two weeks. And Mr. Hogan was wanting to run me. You know, he'd get punish you. He'd run you, get behind you and run. He said, I what told him I can't run. I've been sick. I've had pneumonia. I just, my first day back to school, and you, I can't run. So he said, you're going to run anyway. And he said, I decided I ain't going to run. <laughs> so well, you didn't push James Wyndham. <laughs> no, and he, James Wyndham could beat up. Anybody. Anybody. And he had arms like a, he was a man among boys for sure. But my point is, you're right. Everybody looks back. Mr. Hogan was a unique teacher. He didn't do it like he he put us in real-life situations and help us figure out how to make money and do these games that we played. He was a heck of a teacher, but we had a heck of a group down there, too. (laughs) Yeah, we did. (laughs) So that brings me to something else, and I know that we laugh about this. Everybody knows you. You grew up. You would rather fight than eat. I mean, you were, you didn't back down to anybody. You had a reputation of being a brawler, a fighter. And mm-hmm. so I, I know that's true. I, I would assume I know why. I mean, you felt like you had it worse than everybody, and you had a chip on your shoulder, and you had to prove yourself. Is that? Tell me how that, that came about. That's, that's exactly right. I just, when I got up in the morning, I, my, my life was already done, I thought. But when I went to school, you know, I would just look, try to look on the bright side, but I didn't. People would kind of look, look me down. But uh, I can say this: I had a few of my friends that stayed right there beside of me, and but I got a few of them that, when you're down, they mash you down. But uh, I've never done that to people. People to me, when they're down, you got to help them and pick them up. Yeah, so you learned that the hard way. I learned it the hard way, and and you know, I always and I'm sure it was real. I'm, I probably some of it was your perception because I mean, I know personally, right. I darn sure didn't ever look down on you. I didn't know I was I was cool that you were driving when you were 13, but yeah. but you feel that, yeah. and you feel like people because you've got less. I'm over, I'm over here got whatever I want, and you see that, and you you kind of you know think. That ain't fair. You know, yeah. life ain't fair. Life isn't fair either, is it? <laughs> no, it ain't. No, it ain't. <laughs> it really isn't. And so that's interesting. Your lesson, one lesson you learned there is the last thing you do is look down on somebody because of 
what they have or because of what's going on in their life. You, you, I look at life, everybody's the same. Yeah. There ain't no big ones and there ain't no little ones. Yeah, that's true. And uh, that's just the way I look at it. And I just grew up in a time when it was rough. By the time I moved out, out and I was working at Bluebird, and then I decided I met my wife, and it's probably the best thing in the world that ever happened to me. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Martha, yeah. Martha yeah. Ellen. Yeah. Before we get into Martha Ellen, because I want to hear that story, how many fights you think you've been in in your life growing up? Hundreds. <laughs> really? What? I fought in the first tough man contest ever come to Macon, Georgia. You were a grown man then. I was a grown man. They were having a tough man competition at the, at the Macon Coliseum, had a crowd of people. What, did you have to sign up for it or you just go I, up? I had to sign up for it, and there was uh, 27 of us in there, no weight limit. And uh, you win $1,500. I won't never forget. I said, that's going to be the easiest $1,500 I've ever made. I was working for Warren Green Chevrolet at the time. But Mr. Warren sponsored me. I think he had to pay about $25 entry fee. and But I think I had everybody in Peach County, Taylor County, Crawford County, Macon County there. I had the whole Coliseum slap full because all of them come to see Ray get beat up. <laughs> I stayed all three rounds. and You, uh, you didn't have boxing gloves or nothing? We had, we had boxing oh, gloves. Oh, did you? Okay. But I stayed all three rounds, and the guy I fought weighed uh, 230 pounds, and I think I weighed 160 then. Because there wasn't no weight limit. Right. The guy that that beat me was third runner up out of 27. Is that right? Yeah. So did, did you get hurt? Did you? Oh, get... yeah. I had knots on my head. I busted my nose, my mouth, my jaw. I had knots on me like a porcupine the next day. <laughs> and you stayed with I it? I stayed though. all three rounds. Did other people get knocked out? Oh, a lot of them just got hit one time and quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I should have done. <laughs> but I had all them people backing me up and i couldn't stop yeah you know i don't know what when, when we were kids i knew that you were a fighter and some of us we called you a bully because you know you could you mm -hmm. could back up whatever you said everybody knew it and i'm sure that i was afraid of you but i think we were always friends i mean i don't always i don't, I don't ever remember you even i could i never remembered you well being i'm, I'm gonna tell you, you chuck bird and wimley hartley and uh, Billy Bell, all of us got along real good. We were big in basketball. Right. And I love playing basketball. Right. But Harold Hams, he get us all to the ball games. And I used to sit in the back of the bus with Marcia James. That was my girlfriend back then. Mr. Hams one time told me I couldn't sit with Marcia. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, you're just not going to sit back there with her. And I said, well, yes, I am. So he said, well, i just put you off the bus. So he put me off the bus in Warner Robin, Georgia. Didn't have cell phones back then. Didn't have telephones. I had to borrow a quarter from the people in the uh, Crystal <laughs> to get the phone and made a collect call to my Aunt Jewel and said, I'm stuck over in Warner Robins. He said, how did you get in Warner Robins? I said, Mr. Hand put me off the bus. And I'll never forget, my grandma, when I got home, she said, let me get a hold of him. <laughs> can you imagine this day and time putting a child off on the bus 30 miles 40 miles from home and just putting them out and not worry about where they are yeah that was a different world a different world it? back then That's amazing amazing so talk about martha how, how did you guys meet and how did tell me about the impact she had on you and all that well they used to have these dances out at crossroad school and she used to go out there and we met out there and Hell, I think she was 15 years old, and I asked her, you know, to go out, and I didn't even have a car. My cousin Cheryl, uh, Cranford at the time, she was talking to Martha because I done quit school. And she said, I don't want to go with him. He, he ain't nothing but a, a bully, you know. And finally, one night, they had a basketball game, and uh, they didn't have a telephone either. So we just pulled up in the yard out there about 6 o'clock that afternoon. And I said, you want to go to the ball game with me? You're going to have to go in there and ask my daddy and mama. And it was just like Loretta Lynn, mama and daddy, when he went in there and asked her, could she go where? Because they was in the bed. And I was back and forth, going back and forth to the bed. Could she go to the ball game with me? <laughs> and that's where it first all got started. And what? And you were how old then? Uh, I was 18. 18. <laughs> Uh, 17 because she was 15 i was 17 i think and then 
we dated for a few years, and we finally got married, and she was 17 when we got married. And I was 18 or 19, and uh, her mama had to sign for her. And then when I got married, I won't never forget, uh, we went to Panama City, had $400, and we brought back uh, $200, and she went and got groceries, and we had to put some of them back because we didn't have enough money. <laughs> But uh, I, I remember laying in the bed at night at that time, too, saying this. God, I can't even take care of myself. How am I going to take care of this woman I just married? <laughs> but uh, I became a workaholic yep. because I wanted – she didn't have anything either. I mean, she she come up just like I did. But but her and I together, we, we made it. Yeah, and, you know, so that's remarkable because you came from the, that family background that was very mm-hmm. dysfunctional. And y'all have been married, what, 50 years or something? 50 years. 50 years you've been married to one woman. I mean, that says so much. And I know it ain't yeah. been all roses for 50 years. There's been times that she wanted to kill you a few times. There ain't no doubt about it. That's, I, that's part of it. But the truth of the matter is, through what you went through, you said something earlier that was an amazing comment that I knew I wasn't going to live like my daddy did. And I'm not going to have a family like daddy did. And part of that, was the marriage so you have mm-hmm. you both have been determined to be married and you know stay yeah. together mm-hmm. all these years i mean that's incredible because most i guarantee you 98 percent of the people that live like you did has probably been through at least two or three wives by now yeah. you know and so that's great and when we came up you know and we started having children we had toby first and then tasha i would do it out for them two kids because Every time we sat down to eat, I don't care how much food we had, I backed off and I let them eat. And my wife used to get on to me about that. We got plenty to eat, yeah, but let them. And we used to call my daughter a stockpiler. She would get in there and she'd see the chicken she wanted, she'd pile her plate up and there might be one piece of chicken left. <laughs> but, you know, that's fine. I, I let them eat. But, and that uh, goes back to your thinking. It goes back to my thinking when I remember I didn't have anything. And you wanted your kids yeah. not to grow up like you did. Exactly. And you would rather not eat than, than have them yeah. think for one minute that they didn't have enough to eat. And right? then when it come to cars, I bought every one of them a new car every year. And then I could do it because I would ride in an old truck, but they would be riding in a new car. And I'll never forget. We went to the Chevrolet place one morning. Toby just got his driving license. I said, I got your birthday present. And he didn't know what it was. And Martha and me and Tasha and Toby pulled in there. And John Bear, he was waiting on us at the front showroom. That red truck was sitting in the showroom on the floor. And Toby was bent up by looking at it. But he said, Daddy, I need that truck. And, oh, we can't get that truck. <laughs> and I remember we walked down there and, and uh, handed him the keys, and he drove it out of the showroom, and we, him and Tasha went on to school. And I told them, because I, I didn't have a good education, but I, I told both of them, any time y'all keep good grades and keep good grades, you have a new car. And so you bought them a new car every, every year? Every year, every year. S- from the time they got 16 from on? From the time they got 18 years old. 18 years old. Yeah. And Tasha's had three, four Mustangs. And she, she, she was a little bit rougher on cars than Toby. Right. I think she had a lot of her daddy in her. She'd spin the wheels and right. burn the tires off. And and then come to find out, I always walked around and checked the cars, check the tires, check the everything. And Toby's truck always had good-looking tires on it. And then one day I, uh, after Toby done got grown, Leroy Bear said, Toby, you reckon you ought to tell your daddy what you used to do? He said, no, nah, we don't need to tell him. <laughs> and uh, I said, what's you talking about? He said, Toby would burn a set of tires off, and he'd come down there and get one, and he'd pay me $20 every week until he got that tire paid for. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing that you – y'all got two wonderful kids. Yeah, wonderful kids. I mean, they are, they've done well in life. We're going to go back and talk about how you built this business and how you write checks for these automobiles and stuff. Uh, you, you just bought your grandchild a, a car, bought right? My grandchild. I, mean, I, I bought her three. She's 22 years old, and uh, she just got her last new one. And I told her this was it. I just bought Trenton a new one, turned 15. I bought Toby a Corvette when he was 10, and we kept it in the barn back there. 
until he was 16. So you, you bought a new Corvette, put it in the barn, and never drove it or anything? Right. Unbelievable. Yeah. But I made them payments, and they was rough. <laughs> <laughs> but I always wanted my kids to have more than I had. Because I remember the time when I didn't have a car, and I walked from Reynolds to to the two acres, two, two miles out. So how about Trenton's car? Is it in a barn somewhere? Is it it's sitting up? in Toby's garage right now, waiting until he gets 16. He knows it's there, too, Oh, yeah, he? he's been driving. He got his learning license. Okay. He's got it out and oh, yeah. driven he drives, a little bit. Yeah. Okay, well. Matter of fact, he's done towed it up. <laughs> uh, Martha and him drove to Westfield, and he drove it over there, and it hit a pothole and bent the wheel. And uh, he said, Papa, I just didn't see that hole. And I said, well, don't worry about it. We'll get another wheel. <laughs> but, but Toby and uh, Tasha said, yeah, Daddy, if it been me, you've been fussing. Yeah, but we ain't going to fuss at no granddad. <laughs> Well, my, they both have done well. They're great folks. And, and Toby, now you've got him trained just like your daddy trained you. Yeah. And now he's running this business. Toby you, does a lot better job than I do here because he's got the knowledge of, you know, all this new computer right. stuff and, and all these insurance companies. He works for them, and I'm just kind of the go see her behind. He deals with he my did. computers with all everything's computerized. When you started, it wasn't right. It wasn't. I hand wrote everything. He's running this thing, and you still got an office here and kind of in and out whenever you want to be, and kind of watching what he's doing. That's kind of what it is. Yeah, but I let him have the bull by the horns. Let him go. So let, let's talk about your career. So you started working for uh, Cadillac Place, mm -hmm. and then you you. I know. I remember you worked for Wainwright Ford over in well, Fort Well, I Bettis. worked for Huckabee Cadillac. I worked for Barney A. Smith, and I worked for Mears of Macon, and then I worked for Warren Green Chevrolet, and then I worked for Donald Wainwright. So you worked for a bunch of dealerships. A bunch of dealerships. Just as their body man. As their body man. And so you were getting better and better at what you did, obviously. Yeah. You were getting more and more experience. And and the, and the day my, my daddy died, matter of fact, you came and got my daddy. We found him dead in the house. But after that, I went back to work with Donald Wainwright, and Donald called me in the office. And he said, it's a bad thing to tell you this, but uh, I sold the forward place, and nobody out there knows and he says, uh, it's kind of hard for me to tell you that because, you know, you just lost your daddy. And I said, Donald, I said, you know, it's probably time for me to go out on my own. And he said, well, I can do anything for you. You let me know. And I will never forget, I finished up those two cars. And when I was getting ready to leave, Donald Wainwright walked back there and he said, you see everything in this body shop that ain't tied to the floor? I said, yes, sir. He said, take it with you. Really? And I'll never forget that. And uh, cause that, I mean, this was thousands of dollars worth of material and, and tools and stuff. And uh, he's, oh, he's, I'm gonna be honest with you, Bruce. He's the best boss man I ever had. Well, I'm sure. The best boss man. I'm sure. And uh, he was good to me. Yeah, so he, you, you started off at Yon and you obviously and I've said this, you have a reputation of being the best body man ever. I had a conversation with Ed Swearingen recently, and he was singing your praises. There's no telling how many cars you fixed for him. And This is Ed Swearingen, and as you know, I'm the former owner of Silver Dollar Raceway here in Reynolds. If you look up the word loyalty, in the dictionary, I'm quite sure that Ray Tinkin's picture is on the definition. We did not grow up at the same time. I'm a little older than Ray, and I really didn't get to know him well until uh, he was working in Fort Valley as a body man at the Ford dealership over there. I approached him with the need to paint a race car, and uh, he did a great job on that first race car we had. We got to be uh, close friends at that point in time. Since then, he's He's painted four race cars for me, and I quit counting the number of cars and trucks that he painted for me, but Ray basically adopted me, and I'm going to tell you, with Ray thinking what you see is what you get. Uh, he's totally honest. He will tell, tell it like it is, whether it's good or bad, and if he tells you it's good, it really is. He is one of the most loyal people I have ever had the privilege to meet, and he's taught me a lot about the word loyalty. 
Ray is honest to a fault. He is not the cheapest body man in the world. If you want a car painted, go to Earl Scheib if you're doing it based on price. But as far as the total package, the quality and, and the work that he does, uh, it cannot be beat. He has got the experience and the honesty to go with it. Gives you the full value for what you're paying for the work that he does. Uh, as a matter of fact, my wife's got uh, about over ten thousand dollars worth of deer damage to a brand new Ford Explorer that uh, he's working on as we speak up there at his shop. He is a self-made man. Something about him when I first started getting to know him back in the day, I picked it out in him that he had the potential and uh, the ability to to do what he's done. From the start that he had, uh, he, he has got a fabulous business going here in Reynolds, Georgia. Employs a lot of people and a real asset to the community. I'm proud to say he's one of my best friends. He just You just got that reputation. I mean, you're not just yeah. a little bit good. You, you're like really good at what you do, and everybody knows that. Mm-hmm. So you left... Wayne Wright Ford, he gave you some mm-hmm. equipment. And I remember the place across rent, the street rented, over there. I rented a shop from Tim McCord. Yep, and Fort I, Valley. And I stayed there about four or five years. And this place here come available, and I bought it from Mr. Pete Ass. And we've been going strong ever since. And what, what year did you come to Reynolds? It was in 1989. 89. So you were there for three or four years. So mm-hmm. you, you knew you wanted to come back here. Yeah. Were you a little concerned at some of the business you're getting over there that you wouldn't have enough here or do you have enough clientele? I'm sure there was a little risk involved, right? Well, all the people follow me. Oh, you know, I know they did, but and did you know they would, I guess? No, I didn't, but well, they did. Yeah. All of them follow me. Because, because of your reputation. So you started and you said, man, these people are following me. Well, another reputation you have is you can eat off the floor of of your business here i mean it is clean it's, that's, it's, that's the way i've always been i might have had the raggedest cars but they were the cleanest and tell the story and you you tried to get a building uptown and they turned you down i owned the property across from national guard armory and uh, i was going to build a body shop there the citizens of reynolds told me that they didn't want a body shop in reynolds because they didn't want all of the fumes and whatever and and the junk sitting around so ed swearingen and a few other people went with me to city council trying to get it zoned where I could build a shop there. They turned me down. And I remember uh, a lot of people, after I got this place bought from Pete, I opened up, and a lot of them came out here and started doing business with me. said, I sure am glad you're in a rental. And I said, wait just a minute. <laughs> I said, that city limit sign stops right down yonder. <laughs> I bought a bear Chevrolet, and I said, uh, the rental didn't want me. But I said, the county's got me now. <laughs> but yep. I'll never forget that. Well, and, uh, this business obviously grew and grew. Mm-hmm. You all of a sudden had a machine. You, you've employed a heck of a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, right? There's, there's no telling what you've given away to people that needed it. What you went through, you've helped a heck of a lot of people, I know. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. you got this huge heart i've always known it you're, you're tough as nails you get mad and you grew up fighting you've mellowed out now but i i knew you through all of it yeah you but you always had a huge heart i've told my wife i guarantee you i don't care where i am i can be anywhere in the united states if i need ray tinkin and i call him he's gonna do whatever he can to help me i i've, <laughs> I've said that many times and i i know you're a very very loyal person and a lot of times I've got a problem, I, I'll never forget, you know, when you're coming up, there's a lot of things happen in your life. But uh, Nick Giles, Nick Giles is my buddy. And he was the sheriff here. And I won't never forget when he got to be sheriff, I made all the posters for him and I campaigned him for him. And and, and I told Nick, I said, Nick, where's one of me one of them badges at? <laughs> and he said, uh, well, come up here, I'll give you one. And he gave me a badge. I still got it to this day. So you became and, a deputy sheriff. Well, I was kind of like an honorary. Okay. But anyway, uh, I saw him the next day or two. He said, you know, I ain't slept a bit. And I said, what you talking about you ain't slept? He said, I gave you that badge. I figured you'd had a jailhouse slap full of people. <laughs> <laughs>
This is Nick Giles. Uh, Ray and I met in the seventh or the eighth grade, I guess. Everybody thought he was a bully. And I'll be honest with you, I was terrified of him because uh, he was just literally a brawler. If Ray had had proper training when he was uh, 12 or 13 years old, he could have probably been a fighter. But I guess the reason Ray and I got along so good was our love of automobiles and fast automobiles and high-performance cars. And I think the reason uh, Ray fought so much growing up in school was his. it was a way for him to vent his uh, frustrations of life. Uh, Ray grew up hard. Uh, he didn't have the things a lot of the kids had in the, in school, and uh, he had to work hard. His dad was hard on him. and It made him do a lot of things that little kids didn't have to do. And, and I think that's where that frustration came. The only way that he knew to get it out was fight. And he did do some fight, and I'm here to tell you. Uh, Ray lost some. He won some. But I guarantee you, everybody he ever fought with uh, hated knowing in going into the fight what they were up against. As he got out of school, Ray worked at different body shops. I remember him in Fort Valley with Wainwright Ford over there and uh, several places, but he, he honed his skills very good in the automotive repair business. Later, he opened a shop in uh, Fort Valley and, and honed those skills even more. At that time, he learned about hiring people and had his own employees and and he, he literally learned everything. He learned the business of body and painting from his dad. And then he, he went on further and he, he learned how to uh, manage employees, how to work with employees, how to do books and things like that. Ray's uh, wife, Martha, and I were in the same grade. Ray was maybe a couple of years older than me, but his wife, Martha, and I were in the same grade. So I've been knowing them, you know, pretty much, you could say, all my life. I got elected sheriff here in Taylor County in 1983. Ray was one of my big supporters. And there was a time or two that I had to tell Ray he couldn't do something. And it, it terrified me even then as sheriff, you know, because he'd have that look in his eye. And I thought, oh, hell, we're fixing to have a knockdown drag out here. But uh, but Ray was getting to the age then. And he understood he had to change some of that fighting. And all I told him one day, uh, jokingly, I said, Ray, you ought to do like I've done and quit fighting with your fist and start fighting with one of these pencils. I said, you can do a whole lot more damage to a fellow with a pencil. And I guess he sort of took me up on that because he uh, he, he just learned how to do business and did things good. And, you know, I've I've had I've had friends before and I've got, I've got a lot of friends now. But I consider Ray Tinkin as one of my very best. My daddy told me and my granddaddy told me growing up, said, son, you'll find out going through life that there's only one or two people that would actually put the hand in the fire for you. I'm convinced Ray Tinkin would do that for me if need be. Uh, got a huge heart. He's always doing things for people in the community. And, uh, you know, he's just one of those self-made men. He he did it all. He had no help. But he's just a great guy. And uh, I, if, I, if I got in a fight right now, I'd rather really have, really have Ray Tinkin than I had Dynamite. I know y'all have been great friends. He was a longtime sheriff here. He, he's another guy that thinks the world of you. I thank the world of yeah, him, too. I know you guys go back. So the other thing I was thinking, so you, you've you been over in Fort Valley, and it had to be a little bit of thought in your mind. Now I'm coming back to Reynolds where everybody knows me, and they know my story, mm-hmm. and they probably didn't over there. But now you come back home. Was that something that you thought, I got to go through, even going through this thing and get disapproved, was he thinking, here, I'm dealing with this again, that you exactly got people right. that's looking down on me? Exactly right. And I, I remember my, my daddy and you were good friends. Well, I'm going to tell you, your daddy supported me 100%. Your daddy would come out here to the shop, and he would bring his camera. And he'd be taking pictures of these cars I'm working on. He'd ask all kind of questions. Your daddy was my buddy. Yeah. And uh, I can honestly say that he loved me, and I loved him. Yeah, well, he, he did love you, and he loved what you were doing, and he loved your story. He knew he knew it. He did, and he, he, knew, he knew what you came from and what you were doing. He had mm-hmm. he died way before you doing what you're doing now. I know. But 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 he, even then you were on the way. I mean, you were a very successful business. I remember 
you told me one time about him inviting you to, to Kiwanis Club. That's right. I never had time to go, but he said, I want you to come join the Kiwanis. So I said, okay. So I went and I joined. I probably went for about a year, and then, you know, as you grow bigger here on Fridays, that's when they had the meetings, but I couldn't go on Fridays because I had so much going on. I had to make payroll, right. and uh, he understood that. Yeah. But uh, he'd come out here, and when he got where he was kind of bad about backing up, we had a gate in the back, so I said, you come on, go out the back gate. And I said, he said, you, I can go out the back. I said, yes, sir. I said, you can come in the back, too. You ain't even got to pull around to the front. <laughs> so the front is a big highway, and the reason Ray did that, because he pulled out here a couple of times, about got run over by a transfer truck. Daddy got old. People had to watch out for him. Everybody knew him around here, but he backed into me three times in one day, <laughs> and every time he blamed it on me. <laughs> so he uh, he was he was a character, but he loved you, and the reason he loved you, number one, he loved rental, mm -hmm. and he knew your business was an asset to rentals. He was very impressed with how clean you kept this place, your reputation as a body man, uh, but he was also very impressed the fact that you pulled yourself up by the shoestrings and made a life for yourself yeah. when most people don't, you know, and that's that's what why he loved you, <laughs> you yeah. know. That he saw yeah. that, and he was one of those people that <clears throat> he was a great man. He's one of those people that loved it. He's sitting here, you got a beautiful house here. You you built a beautiful house. You got land here. You got I don't even know how much land you got here, but you got plenty. Twenty years ago, or so or whenever it was, you bought a house right on the beach at Panama City. This is the same guy that was laying in bed at night crying, saying, well, life always be like this. Now he's got this thriving business in this little town called Reynolds, Georgia, that does more revenue in here than probably any business in you know, miles of here. He's He's got a beautiful house. Now he's bought a house at the beach, and you've had it for 20, 20 years. 20 years. 20 years that you've got a beach. He, he buys his children a vehicle every year while they were growing up. He's buys his grandchildren, just bought one of them a brand new Corvette that's sitting in the garage. He can write a check for anything he wants to write it for. So that is what we're talking about. And I'm sitting here looking at him. Ray, what do you tell people who are lying in bed at night? And I know there are people that are like this, that are listening to this, that are lying in bed at night and maybe crying. It may not be because their dad was an alcoholic. It may be it may be something entirely different. It could be a lot of different issues. We got a long list of stuff people go through. But a lying in bed at night saying, God, will life always be like this? What is your advice to them? Well, I, I tell you, I still lay down every night and I pray for other people. I pray for these kids that don't have anything to eat. I pray for these kids that's laying up in a hot house trailer with no air. I've been there. I pray for them every night. I don't pray for myself anymore. I pray for somebody else because it's somebody else's kids. And I love kids. And I'm going to tell you, and with this war going on over there, I pray for them every night. There's a lot of people still just like I was and that probably laying down there doing the same thing. But as long as they keep in touch with God, they'll find it. So you, you were, when you were praying, I remember you told me your mama a long time ago when you were a kid gave you a verse that said John three sixteen. That's exactly right. And and you clung on to that. I and, hung on to that, and I still got that little Bible. Yeah. And she marked it out and underlined it. So here's here's a lady that I think you said she had a, had fourth, a fourth grade education. fourth grade education lived in absolute hell. Right. And she gave her only son a bible verse that he kept with him all these years i watched him at the funeral i think you had that little bible i did and you read that verse that she gave you mm -hmm. and that has been your guiding force all your life that there's a somebody bigger than us that can help us through whatever we're going through mm -hmm. and that's that's what you you give credit to god and you've leaned on that all your life right right and but you also you also one determined guy. You know, I tell the story about Eulen Brown. You know you remember Eulen yes, well. I do. He was always in the ditch. His papers were always strong, but he didn't know what the word quit was. And and you remember him delivering grit papers I, I, on his bicycle. I remember him real good. I've told that story all over the country. And most people don't know him. You know him as good as I do. 
but he was, you know, he had a disease and he couldn't walk straight. You think he was intoxicated, but he never quit. He was always papers everywhere. But my mental picture of him, he was always gathering his papers back up to get them in the basket to get on down the road. And, and that's kind of what you've done. You've had some roadblocks along the way. You just didn't flip a switch and all of a sudden you were writing checks for everything. You've gone mm-hmm. through all kinds of stuff yeah. to get where you are. But you were one determined sucker that your determination was, I don't have to live like this. And if I can do anything about it, I'm not, and I'm not going to let my kids do this. And you worked your butt off. You told me that you became a workaholic. You were determined, and you were doing it for them. You really yeah. were never doing it for you. You exactly. were doing it for them because of what you went through. Exactly right. I always wanted to make sure mine had the best. And they had clothes that wouldn't have been made, you know, and and uh, always had the best. And Toby, always on time. I've never had a problem out of him. But uh, Tasha, I'm going to tell you, she's like a daddy. She's old bullhead, but I still loved her just as much as I did sure. Toby. They all different. And all that's okay. Different. That's okay. But you got some wonderful kids, and that's because of you and Martha Ellen. Y'all made a heck of a team, mm-hmm. and uh, y'all been together a long time. She she can stand up to you, I guarantee you that. Oh, yeah, she can. She, <laughs> she can. She has, even in your bullying days, she wasn't intimidated no. one bit. But it's you, you've made a great team. You've made a great life, and it's, it's a heck of a story. Yeah. One day, I have a feeling that somebody's going to be listening to this that are your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, not even born yet, who knows, that are going to listen to their grandfather, Ray, talking. And what would be your advice to them, the people that will listen to this one day, 25 years from now, after me and you are dead and gone, what's your advice to them? When you lay down at night, always remember, God has got you. If you ask God anything, it don't matter what, He will answer those prayers because he has really answered mine. I'm on the outside looking in. Bruce knows and a lot of other people know that I'm just old down the earth guy and I believe in helping other people. And all you gotta do is ask God and he'll help them just like he helped me. I've got a lot of friends that uh, stood behind me. It don't matter what it is in life, there's always a good answer for it. It's, it's always good to have friends too, right? And that's right. And, and good friends. To have friends, you got to prove yourself friendly. Yeah. And so you've done that. Yeah. And, and remember, don't never stomp on anybody that's down. Don't never do that. Always try to lift them up. Right. It don't matter what the situation is. Everybody's got something in life. But you have to step up to the plate and, and try to help other people. Right. And I've done that all my life. And you have, and you keep on doing it. I want to tell you, I appreciate our friendship. I don't think I ever talked to you on the phone where you don't end up saying, I love you, man. I love you, Bruce. I say the same thing to you. That's right. We do. And uh, I, I sincerely appreciate our friendship. It's been uh, an honor for me to sit down and, and get part of this story out and, uh, and your story and let people hear it. Well, I do remember when you came up one day and wrote an article on me. And I'm going to tell you what. I was so proud of that article. You you did a great job. Uh, a lot of people called me and, and said, I read that article. He said, oh, you ain't mad at Bruce about putting that in? I said, everything Bruce said is the truth. And I said, there's no other way than say it. But he said it in a way that it just brings out the part of me. And I loved it. Yeah, I so I actually wrote two articles. I wrote one long time ago and then I wrote one after your mama died after I listened to you yeah. talk. You were an easy subject. You were a great subject matter and I just know there's people struggling. There's people think they're beat. There are people that are hopeless in whatever situation like you were as a little kid. You yeah. had this hopelessness yeah. feeling. You, you never know. With, with the good Lord above and, and you being determined, you never know what's going to turn out, right? That's right. Well, man, you've done well, Ray, and I'm I'm proud of you. I'm proud for you, and I love you, brother. I love you too, Bruce. Thank you, man. Thank you. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker.